What's up, everybody? Welcome to the live Q&A about the Zen Float Tent. I'm Shane, and I'm going to be answering all the questions I can for you today. And we might as well dive right in. What is the first question? All right. All righty. All right, so someone wants to know, how portable are the float tents if they were to move? And if I have any suggestions on how to move a float tent. So that is tricky because the, the float tent is super portable. It's light and it's foldable and it's everything about it is easily shippable and movable. The problem you're gonna have is the water. So there is about, I forget the weight in the water, but it's something like 1,000, 1,200 pounds of water. Um, it's 200 gallons, and the trick is where you're going to put the water, how you're going to move it. I know they have big water um, bladders for like emergency purposes, that sort of thing. So you could sump pump the water out of your out of your float tent into the water reservoir, and then you could move that. Um, the other the other option is you pour out your water, and then when you need it again, you have to get new water, put new salt in, that sort of thing. So. There's a couple options, but the water is what makes it tricky. So if you had a reservoir, moving your float tank will be easy because you just pump it into the reservoir, move, pump it back into your tank. So it's kind of tricky, but it is doable. Grab the next question. All right, are there any kind of upgrades you guys are planning on releasing, such as a stronger pump, better filter, that sort of thing? So we, we are working on upgrades right now. Um, the as far as the filter and the cleaning everything should be totally good you won't you won't need to upgrade it um, but what we are offering as far as upgrades and that sort of thing is a sound system which is we're working on that now and we're also going to offer the underwater earplugs because we we have a float app now so you can decide excuse me so you can play what tracks you want to get into your float um, then decide how long you want your float to be and then how to exit your float so we have a float app you'll be able to listen to that underwater You'll also be able to eventually record thoughts you have, and that's one of the upgrades we're offering. I'm trying to think, right now we are, what are we working on? We're working on some general fixes with stuff that people have had issues with. Um, we're just kind of upgrading the door and some of the design work, but uh, this should be the product that we're gonna go with, so it should be good. All right. Um, are there extra parts available to do repairs? So as far as extra parts go, we do have anything that you purchase with the float tent, we do have extra parts to repair it with. So if we don't have them on the website, call us and we can get that sent out to you. Uh, but we definitely have every part you could need to replace or repair anything that you have in your float tent. All right, how long does it take to filter the water in the float tent. So what is the best recommended time between floats? So what I would say is on floating, it's not, if you're, if you're fully showering, which you should be before you float, and then you hop in the tank, you can float back to back um, a couple times a day if you need it. The water does filter two to three times fully daily. So if you're floating daily, twice daily, or if you have someone else who's using the tent with you, if you guys are cleaning beforehand, there shouldn't be any water filter or water problems. It's going to be clean water because you're a clean person getting in. So as long as you take care of your water and maintain it, you could float two, three times a day if you need it. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, yeah, but the, the water fully does cycle two to three times a day. If you have any questions pop up, just type them in the chat box and we'll we'll address all of them. All right, where are most people buying their Epsom salts? Okay, so Epsom salts is a big deal because as you know, Epsom salts aren't the cheapest thing to buy. Um, when I bought my tank, I found a local supplier called Univar, I believe. Um, there's a couple online outfits, SF Salt, that sort of thing. The good news is we we hear you. You guys need salt at a good rate, and we have 
sourced our own salt and it's Zen float salt and we should have that in in the next two weeks I believe so the the trickiest part for us is going to be setting up our freight system but we will have salt on our website to buy uh, I would say in about two weeks so look forward to that the only tricky thing is when you order salt from us we'll just have to grab you a live quote send that out and um, should be good to go so we are setting up salt ourselves All right, how to set up the condensation flaps in the tent. So, it'd be tricky to show you, but when you set up the tub of your tank, uh, it's the big black eight by four foot tub, and in that tub design, there's flaps that kind of come out of the corner. So what you do is you lift those flaps up and you put it on, there's an angled pole for the, for the roof design right here. Maybe I can show it. Uh, so what it is, is, there's this pole right here, and the tub has a flap that you actually lift up and put the O-ring over the corner piece. And once that O-ring's in place, you slide your cover down over everything. And what you do is, from inside the tank, you have to make sure that you're lifting the flaps. So the flaps hang in on the inside, but you pull the flaps up and make sure, it's almost like shingles. You pull the plastic pieces up so the water flows into the tank and then when you're tucking the corners you just make sure that originally when you pull the when you pull the float tank cover down over it can tend to fold the flap back so what you gotta do is get in there and make sure that the flap is up on the float tank wall like this so that when water comes down it goes on that flap and stays into the water but the easiest way I found is to hop in there with a flashlight and really push and make sure everything's secure and that when you tap and water rolls down that it rolls down into the tank um, that is one of the challenges with the with this design is the, the corners but I promise you if you get in there and take the time you can really get a good seal and a good shingle effect where you won't have any leakage but what a lot of people do is they they throw the cover over they call it good they never actually inspect the inside lining at all and they'll get little water drips on the corner so really just take the time get in there and make sure each corner is perfect and then you'll stop all the dripping and you'll be much happier because then you won't have any white spots or anything on the drip mat what have been the nature of damages that needed repair all right so some of the damages we have let me think about it. we had we've had a couple people so we we did a lot of testing on um, in a few different places with the flow tent and we found that there was a few people who had uh, electrical issues in their home where there was a loop between the power and the GFCI so we've had some people where their GFCI trips and it's nothing about the design of the tank, it's actually the design in their electrical system in their house. It's not grounding well and that sort of thing. So that is one of the issues we've had to work on. Um, we've had people who are a little aggressive on the door, throw this open and get a little bit of a tear right here in that inside door flap. But I, I mean, I shoot tails in the tent, I float and I use this all the time and I just, I take care of it, I don't throw it out. And I've never had an issue with my door, no tears or anything. So I think it's a matter of being careful when you're hopping in and out. So I haven't had any problem with the door, although a couple people have. Um, let me think what else. Oh, I know one thing. Some people, so these are the air vent caps that keep the light out when you're of the the air vent they keep the light out so the air still flows in but it doesn't affect your float but as some people have had problems with these where they're tucking in these little pieces and one breaks but I haven't had that problem either and I put them in and out a lot so I think a big matter is being easy not easy on the tent but just just taking care of it and making yeah just taking care of it and being easy on the tent and the pieces and when you're when you're using your float tent, that sort of thing. All right. Let me grab the next one. All 
All right, this is, I would say this is one of the trickiest ones we've had, and it's because we don't have a great answer for it. Uh, we do have an answer. So is, is everyone familiar with the temperature probe that, of course, senses the temperature? And we've had issues where people are putting it on the surface and they're getting an you know, inaccurate reading or they're putting it right down on the heating pad and it's flicking on and off all the time. So the tricky part is where do you put that temperature probe? And mine's in my tank. But the way I've found that works best is getting it a few inches off the bottom. And if you know, there's a, there's a water filter in your float tent and it has a tube coming out of the end and it kind of has little ridges on it. But I actually take my probe and I tie it to that hose. So, and then I pull it so I make sure there's no way it's moving. It's not gonna go up and it's not gonna go down. And that's the best way I've had to set up my temperature probe. Um, some people, there's little uh, tube channels in the side of the tank and some people put it in there. I tried that and it, it seems to not work well because when you put it in the side of the tank, it's actually getting some of the cooler temperature from your room at the wall of the tank. So that temperature probe is getting an inaccurate reading and heating your water too hot. So you do want the probe in the middle of your tub, in the middle, but uh, at least you know eight inches from each wall. I have mine really tied to my filter and it works like a charm. So uh, the other, the other uh, advice I had, oh, a guy named Terrence, he said that he uses magnets to, to attach his probe to the wall of his tank. So it sticks off a little bit, but it, it's the only answer we don't have a perfect one for. We don't say, oh, put it in this slot. You're going to have to figure out a place to tie it. But I tied mine to my filter, and it works like a charm. So it's not too tricky. All right, the best place to put your float tent. It's a good question. If you have a room, so this is my basement. If you have a room with hardwood floors or tile floors, that's ideal. Um, it just makes, because I mean, salt residue does get around. So if you're using it on, there's a little salt right there. So if you're using it on a carpet, you're just gonna have to make sure you really dry off well. Um, so you don't track any salt water on the carpet. That's the only thing I would say about the surfaces is it's nice. I have a hard surface, I can just wipe it off if I track any salt, so I don't have to be as careful. So that'd be the first thing. Also. It's nice to have access to walk around your tank. So I can fully walk around the side, the back, and it, it allows you to work on everything. I know some people don't have space, but if you can afford to at least leave a foot, you're going to be way better off because you'll find that you'll, you'll want to open up your tank and clean the water, or you'll open up your tank to look at some piece or tie the temperature probe. So ideally, if you can leave yourself some space to get around, you'll be much happier with it. All right, if I want a tank in April, when is the latest I should place my order? Okay, cool. So right now, you guys are familiar with, uh, we, we funded on Kickstarter, and we did everything we could possibly do to meet the deadlines, and I swear to you, it's the only thing we focused on, and we still came in just a little bit late, I believe a month or two late, um, and we've been, we've been kind of pre-selling a month or two out. Uh, we are just now catching up with inventory, so, I mean, we plan to be caught up in January, but things keep stretching out. Um, if you wanted a tank in April, for sure, I would say just check back monthly to make sure, because on our website, we put what month's tank, tanks we're selling. So right now, we're into January. Um, in January, it might be February. Hopefully, we get caught up and live by January, February, where when you order, your tank ships. So I would just say check back and just check the the title of the tent because we will put when it when it will ship. What is the accuracy of the temperature regulation on the heating pads? Can you manually ad manually adjust on the fly? Okay, so we wanted to have really really accurate temperature adjustment on our float tank, and it was one of the things that made it so uh, it made it a little finicky because we put to point one degrees so people would put i want you know 93.4 degrees and then it would it would every time it would flick up or excuse me every time it'd go 93.2 or 3 it would turn on flip that tank to a tenth of a degree so 
it's very accurate and with that comes you know sometimes it's too sensitive because it's it's constantly turning on and off trying to maintain a perfect perfect temperature what i would say to do um this is what i do when i float is i'll, I'll keep i float at about 93 and a half degrees and so when i i store my tank at 93 and then when i'm ready to float i'll come in and put it at 93 and a half and it will take about an hour or so maybe a little less to get up to temperature but you won't notice it when you're floating um, but that way it's not you know flipping on and off trying to maintain your temperature it'll just be gradually climbing during your float so there's ways you can kind of work around that adjustment but it does work to a tenth of a degree okay i have issues with the clicking gfci when the temperature drops and raises i can't hear it with earplugs any suggestions well that's good so that's that's one of the things that i recommend is with the float tent the one thing we couldn't nail is getting rid of all the audio but if you've ever been to a float center they always say you know be quiet you got to be quiet when people are floating because there's no float tank that perfectly gets rid of sounds in the room or the house or bass sounds whatever so i definitely recommend to float with earphones or excuse me earplugs um, when you're floating with earplugs you won't hear you know footsteps cars things like that and with the with our temperature control there's a little click when it clicks on and off to regulate that temperature but if you have any ear, earplugs in you won't even hear it um, I would just say use the earplugs I mean it, it's it, it works anyways uh, it's better anyway and even if you were in a float center a lot of them provide earplugs so it seems to be the way to get the most audio out of the room or out of the experience grab the next one Okay, so this one's the same type of question. It says, are the tents capable of muting out all distractions? And like I was saying, so the float tent won't get rid of all audio distractions, but neither will any float tank. Um, this is, ours has the thinnest walls. It's shippable, it's portable, it's affordable. So naturally that's our challenge, but uh, earplugs are the way to go. And if you want earplugs, I mean, they should be available anywhere. We have some Zen earplugs on our website. I think they're coming up soon. And I would highly recommend wearing earplugs. And not to mention, soon we will be having uh, underwater earbuds coming out so that you can use the float app and listen to guided meditations or music to get in and out of your float. And those will help with sound uh, regulation or dampening too. So those are a couple of the options. Okay, so some people are saying the UV filter sits on top of the water and doesn't stay at the bottom of the tent. Is this a problem or does it make a difference in the effectiveness of filtering the water? Uh, it does. My, I've never seen this problem personally, but the black filtering box, it's about the size of a loaf of bread. Some people are having it float up a little bit. I don't know why. My, mine, when I... I'll put my filter in and I'll move it around so that all the air bubbles flow out and then it just sits down on the bottom of my tent. So the first thing I'd recommend is make sure that there's no trapped air in there making it float. The other thing is when you're threading your hose through the tub, if you leave a lot of extra hose coming out of the wall and down around your tank, there's going to be enough hose where your filter will just start to raise up because there's no, there's no hose keeping it down. Mine, my float tank, the hose comes out and it just comes out maybe 10 inches right into the filter. So there's nowhere for the filter to want to go anyway because the hose goes right to it. So that's another thing I'd recommend doing. Uh, the part you want to be concerned about is on the filter. I wish I had one out. I usually have spare parts, but uh, on the filter, you're just going to want to make sure the vented part stays underwater because that is the intake. So there's half the filter has these vents all around it. Make sure that part is fully underwater that's where it draws in the water. And if that's drawing in air, if it's, that's sitting out, if the vented part is sitting out of the water, then you're going to be drawing in air and it's a little harder on the pump. So make sure that part's in. Like I said, make sure there's no air bubbles in it and make sure the hose is just long enough to keep it down on the ground. Cool.
Cool. Uh, where can I get the Zen Float app you were talking about earlier? So that we have just been going through the final stages of using it, and it's awesome actually. So let me explain the app, and then I'll explain where to get it. But on the app, you you choose your float time, and then you choose your intro and your outro of your float. So for me, I'll choose a really relaxing song to get into the tank to get into my float. You choose the song, then you choose how long you want it to fade. So you could have it fade for 5, 10, 15 minutes into your float, and it will just fade out. And then you choose the length of your float, so you could choose an hour, hour and a half, whatever that is for you. And then you have the fade fade in or the outro track. So once you know the 60 minutes is up, your favorite song will come on. So for me, I like something kind of inspirational, uplifting, and that will come on for a fade of, say, 5, 10 minutes. So it's a really cool app for designing your float and having the right amount of time in the float. The Float app will be available on uh, just the Apple, I guess the uh, App Store, the iTunes Store. So look for it there, and then we should have an Android version out shortly after. I wouldn't imagine it's too hard to replicate it for Android. So just check the Apple Store for that app, and it should be there, I would say, in the next week. When I go out of town for a month, can I leave the heating pads off? and pump off or keep the pump on. So um, a month is a long time. I recommend never turning off your tank because it takes about an hour a degree to get up to temp. So if your resting water temperature, if you didn't have anything plugged in, would be about, say, 60 degrees. So it's going to take 30 or so hours to get it up to temp and a lot more power than just maintaining. So it's going to be up to you. If you're leaving for a month, it shouldn't be any problem to just unplug everything and let it sit. I would make sure all your water levels um, uh, are, when I, when I say water levels, make sure your water is totally clean and maintained before disconnecting it. That way you won't have any uh, just cleanliness issues. You won't have any mildew or smelly water when you get back. Um, and just when you get back, just keep in mind it's going to take a couple days to get back up to temp. But there shouldn't be any problem with turning it off. Uh, with turning it off and with anything never ever put more salt than you need in your tank and this would come in with turning the tank off too because the temperature would drop and salt crystallization changes depending on how hot your water is so for us this is the Zen float hydrometer if you have a float tent uh, you've probably used it but it's awesome because this is the exact measurement that you need to keep your salt saturation at never ever keep it over because if you had, say you had too much salt in your tank, and because it was warm, it stayed fluid, but then you unplugged your tank to go on a vacation and you came back, you would get crystallization. Some of the salt would kind of turn into almost just sheets of it looks like ice crystals. Could get into your pump, it could cut your tub. So how I relate that is I'm saying, if you're going to unplug your tank, don't ever have it over the right salt saturation. And for that matter, never have your tank over the right salt saturation because it, it could really harm your tank. When you float and turn off the filter, can you also turn off the heating as well? Or will the water cool down too fast for a 90-minute float? Let me read that again. Okay, so the, what they're saying is they unplug the filter for their float, for a 90-minute float, and they're asking if they can unplug the heating. And I would say not to because your water level will drop or your temperature will drop. So there's no reason not to just have your heater in and maintaining. When I had the home-built tank in the room next door, um, I insulated it really well with home insulation. and Even that tank would drop about a degree an hour. And... Say you're an hour, half, hour, hour and a half into the float, the float tent might be, you know, two degrees colder than when you started, and you might really start to notice the water temperature and the air temperature. So I would say don't unplug your heating unless there's some specific reason. It's really just nice having a constantly maintained heating temperature. So that's what I would do is just leave the heat plugged in. All right, this question came up just recently. Um, and I don't have a great answer for it. It says, any problem using reverse osmosis water to fill the tank? Uh, all I know about reverse osmosis is it's a cleaning method for bottled water. But out of all the water care and water people I've talked to and everything I've ever heard, 
I've never heard of someone saying, you know, don't use too filtered or too clean of water because the salt won't saturate or something will happen. So I can't see any harm in using, you know, reverse osmosis water. Uh, that's, that's, that's the only reason I know how to answer it is because I've never heard of anyone having an issue, but I don't know for positive. What is the accuracy of the temper, temperature regulation on the heating pads? Can you manually adjust it on the fly? I think I understand this question. So what is the accuracy of the temperature regulation on the heating pads? Can you manually adjust? I mean, with, with our heating pads and temperature controller, you can always change the temperature on the fly. It's going to take a second for the pads to get the water water to temp, but I'm not sure I understand that question totally. But I mean, you can adjust your heating pads anytime you want to the tenth of a degree, so it's pretty sweet. All right. All right. Is it safe to set up my tank on the second story of an apartment building? Um, you know, the, the, the <laughs> it's a funny question. So the tank is designed not to leak or have an issue at all. So there, you should be able to set it up anywhere. It shouldn't matter. You should be able to set up an apartment, a duplex, a condominium, whatever that is. Um, if you're worried about, because here's the thing, uh, no matter how well we design this, it's still a canvas tank, so a, a kid could still throw some toy, or someone could get in with a you know a sharp object or a shoe or a belt or anything could happen. I guess is what I'm saying. So you could have a leak, and if you're in a condominium, you could flood the neighbors below and the neighbors below. So accidents can happen. The tank's not going to leak because of design errors. Um, but what if? And then what would be covered? I know when we were first looking into you know, sending these tanks out, we recommend people if they want added insurance to call their home insurance company and say, hey, you know, I've got this soaking tub. It's kind of like a spa-like soaking tub device. Um, here's what's in it. It's 200 gallons of water. It's heated. I need to add it to my insurance. And that's one way you could have some added protection. Um, yeah, that's, that's going to be up to you. I would also say if you're really concerned and want the good blessing of where you live, you could contact your HOA or the condos or the apartments and tell them what it is and what it does. Um, I don't I don't think it would go over that well because they probably wouldn't understand what it is and what it does, but it's going to be up to you. Um, an accident could happen, so your home, homeowner's insurance or the apartment insurance would cover if there was a puncture and a spill, but it's going to be, have to be your own call on that one. But as far as the design, Totally safe, you should be able to put it absolutely anywhere. Cool, was there any thought of using ozone like you did with your tank in the basement? Okay, so with my tank in the basement, it was not a consumer product, it was a DIY, you know, do it yourself tank, and I was very much into ozone because Ozone was very easy to use, but it also comes with a little bit of danger. So if you're not familiar with the ozone, an ozonator is a machine that injects, I believe it's just pure oxygen into the bubbles of your water, and that cleans and kills any bacteria instantly. But they say that the off-gassing, so the air that comes out of the bubbles is actually dangerous to breathe, and I believe it because when I used ozone in my homemade tank, where the ozone shot out, it actually browned and kind of discolored the plastic. So there was something really aggressive going on there. So for my do-it-yourself tank, I thought it was awesome that I could just plug in an ozonator overnight and get a whole bunch of cleaning done. That was cool to me. Um, but with the float tent, we needed an option where it's kind of consumer proof because everyone's going to get this thing and not totally know what they're doing, not fully understand things and just start using it. So ozone was kind of a scary option for us to use because you don't want to be breathing that air. So the, the filtering, the mechanical and the UV filter that we used with the uh, water maintenance guide with the hydrogen peroxide and the pHs, that is the easiest, safest, best way to clean a float tank. And that's why we chose it for the float tank. So ozone is a personal preference. I wouldn't recommend it because then you have to worry about, you know, what air is in the tank? Has it properly ventilated? How long has it been since I ozoned? 
what if you forgot to turn it off? Uh, so I don't recommend it. I was just winging it um, when I built my tank, obviously, and uh, I like ozone, but with, with what we got in the float tank, you're good to go. So I would just stick with it. Oh, this is a good question. Uh, this has popped up a bunch. Uh, what are your feelings for using the tank for commercial use? And my feelings are, don't do it. Um, we didn't design this for commercial use at all. And commercial use, if you had a float tank in a float center, it's going to get used possibly a dozen times a day. And we just didn't design it for th that sort of traffic. So there's things like, I mean, if I use my door once or twice a day, I mean, that's, that's not going to add up as fast as 10, 12 times a day. It's just not designed for commercial use. Uh, we, it's for light, indoor, home use. Um, not a lot to say on it. The filter also um, filters in float centers with the commercial tanks. They filter much, much faster. I believe some filter the whole water in you know, 15, 20 minutes, where this could take eight hours to filter your water fully. Um, it's perfect for home use. It's perfect for you, maybe another person in your home to float, but it's just not a commercial design. So. We don't recommend it at all, so don't do it. And uh, we are not going to get into the commercial tank market. We are very much trying to make floating affordable and accessible to the masses, to home home floaters and enthusiasts. So that's where we're at, and that's what we're going to keep doing. All right. Have you ever read any of Dr. Lilly's books? What are your thoughts about ECCO? I am not familiar with ECCO. Um, I just read Programming and Metaprogramming. It was a book that uh, Float On, Ashcon, and Graham really promoted. And as I was reading it, there was a lot of stuff that was really cool. That you could tell he was a very much an explorer of the mental realm and some of the, his use of hallucinogens and everything really were interesting to me, but it didn't all fully relate to me. It was A lot of it was a stretch. And I think that's why a lot of people really like Dr. Lilly is because a lot of his stuff is a stretch. And he was really out there doing pretty interesting and creative, crazy experiments and explorations into the mind and reality. And so uh, personally, I don't really click with Dr. Lilly. I've read a couple of his things, but uh, everyone should try out a little Dr. Lilly stuff because some people just love it and can't read enough of it. So it's pretty cool. All right, I don't see anything. Let me hop in. We have some saved questions. Let me see if I can pull those up real quick. That, I believe, is all the questions. Let me check. Cool. Well, uh, I do want to apologize. The last Q&A we did, I am halfway good at technology and that sort of thing, but for some reason we couldn't get Google Hangouts to work, and it didn't record, so this one will be recorded. It is recorded, so just wanted to apologize for our last Q&A. Um, if you have questions, send them in to info, excuse me, info at zenfloatco.com. Also, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. We also have a new hire named Mason. Uh, there's a little blog about him on our website, and he is our... 24 hour customer service dude. So if you have questions, he's got answers and he has access to everyone else in the company. So if he doesn't have your answer, he'll find it quick. And he's been a real awesome addition to our team. Um, that's about it. Uh, <laughs> that's all I got. Well, thanks guys for tuning in. I hope I could be of some service to answer your questions. If you have any, just email them info at Zenflow Co and we'll answer them as we go. But thanks guys and uh, happy floating.